So I think we're going to wait for another two minutes. Um, but I can already like kind of say what this lecture is about. It's about um, the direct integration with Bitcoin, another flagship feature that the internet computer offers. Um, I think it's the, actually the first of, a, of its kind. And there's a lot of engineering effort behind it. I think since it was announced, it took like over a year to get to the point where we have like a API on the management canister that can be consumed by others. So the feature is like actually like live, live, which is pretty cool. And there are already the first projects building on it, mostly like DeFi projects that either want to natively integrate with the um, management canisters API, which is a bit low level, or they sometimes also um, wait for CKBTC to be live, which is basically wrapped Bitcoin on the internet computer. Uh, it has some advantages over other wrapped versions of uh, BTC on different chains. And we will actually get into that um, in the presentation as well. So it's going to, going to follow like the same pattern again. We are first listening to the lecture. Then I will make like a Q&A session for the lecture. And then after that, we're actually going to code something. And today we're actually building on top of CKBTC. So we are using CKBTC and to get people to pay for something that we offer as a service. Yeah, but I will talk about it in the in the talk as well. So um, also probably this lecture is going to take a little bit longer again. Um, I'm sorry, but it was very hard to uh, yeah get all of the content into an hour. Uh, but I think it should be worth it. I think it's like the outcome that we have in the end is like pretty pretty cool, and I think that. If you follow along and you later on like need that in a project or something, it's like really, really helpful to get like a rough idea of how it could be done. So maybe we wait another two minutes or one minute. How is everyone's project coming along? Send me a thumbs up in the chat if it's going good. I would show chat disabled. Oh, yeah. I can see your question, uh, Swaystar. Swaystar asks, kind of unrelated, but do you think it's possible to stream 4K footage from the IC? stream as in like how YouTube streams videos. I think that should be in theory possible. I think we already have like a, a video hoster on the IC. But I forgot the name. I think it was portal maybe. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've seen I've seen videos streamed from the internet computer. I don't know if they were like 4K videos, but in in general, it's definitely possible to stream video files um, from the internet computer. What's gone? Um, I think the chat is enabled now. Um, at least I see some other messages in the chat. Okay, Lee said that Canister did this with the help of Portal. Um, all right. Okay, I think we are, we are starting now. I will stop my video and mute myself.
Okay, apparently no sound. Then let me restart. Sorry. Uh, should work now. I'm going to start over. Sorry. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Moritz. I'm a developer relations engineer at Definity. I've been active in the Definity community since early 2018 and I'm really happy to participate in the Motoko Bootcamp as a mentor. This presentation covers the internet computer's direct integration with the Bitcoin network. So what actually is the direct Bitcoin integration? In one sentence, the Bitcoin integration allows canisters on the internet computer to receive, hold and send Bitcoin all directly with transactions on the Bitcoin network. To understand why this is awesome, we first have to take a look at how things used to work. So a good example, as we are talking about Bitcoin, is wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. So when using Red Bitcoin, you are actually trusting two groups of people. The first group are the custodians, they hold the assets, in this case um, BTC. And the second group are the merchants, and they are the only ones allowed to mint or burn Red BTC on Ethereum. And even though the plural of custodian is used, it's actually only one single company that access the custodian, and the name of the company is BitGo. So to mint wrap BTC and thus bridge BTC to Ethereum, a merchant has to send Bitcoin to the custodian, which then upon arrival mints the same amount of wrap BTC to the merchant. If a user wants to bridge his BTC to wrap BTC, he has to actually go through KYC and AML with the merchant, send him the BTC and then wait to receive back the wrap BTC. If a user wants to go the other way around and bridge his red BTC back to BTC, he again has to send red BTC to the merchant together with KYC and AML and then wait to receive back the BTC. As stated within the red BTC white paper, you have to trust the custodian not to run away with your funds, not to get hacked and to honor the one-to-one -one backing of red BTC with BTC. To minimize the trust, they say the custodian cannot mint tokens on their own, but need the initiation of a merchant to do so. But it should be fairly easy to find merchants to collude with to print money out of thin air if they wanted to. They also state their framework minimizes trust as the credibility of the institutions involved is at stake. That's not really an argument I should trust my money with. So we call this type of a bridge a trusted bridge. A trusted bridge depends on a central entity for operation. It has trust assumptions with respect to the custody of the funds and security of the bridge. Users rely on the bridge operator's reputation and users need to give up control of their assets. So now that we know how things used to work, let's take a look at the internet computer's direct integration with the Bitcoin network. As mentioned earlier, the Bitcoin integration allows canisters on the internet computer to receive, hold and send Bitcoin all directly with transactions on the Bitcoin network. And direct in this context means that no trust assumptions are required other than trust in the correct functioning of the Bitcoin network and internet computer. So in other words, there are no additional parties required, such as bridges or other types of intermediaries, resulting in a much cleaner and more secure integration. This also means that Bitcoin from insecure centralized bridge services, which have been hacked for billions of dollars in the past, are no longer needed in DeFi and Web3. So why is this important? It's important because it opens up a lot of new use cases that couldn't have been realized before. A couple of examples are on-chain Bitcoin wallets with biometric authentication without the user being required to manage the private key or SocialFi where users can do peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin transactions using social dApps. Also trading Bitcoin directly on decentralized exchanges on the internet computer without requiring any third party custody of the assets. You could also use Bitcoin to buy tokens in a decentralization sale when an SNS powered DAO decentralizes a service on the IC. And an entire class of applications is DeFi built around Bitcoin, which could previously only be implemented with red Bitcoin requiring additional trusted entities. 
Another use case are chain key Bitcoin, also called CKBTC, which is an advanced variant of wrapped Bitcoin. And CKBTC is actually the easiest way to handle Bitcoin on the internet computer and might be the right choice for many people. And we'll talk more about it later. And many, many other use cases that we haven't imagined yet. So for this presentation, I kind of assume that the audience is familiar with the Bitcoin network. But one thing I want to explain in a bit more detail, so you're able to understand the rest of the presentation, are UTXOs. As a simple example here, BTC is used to transfer money. Alice wants to send 400,000 Satoshis to Bob. And for that, Alice has to consume two unspent transaction units or UTXOs, which sums up to the 400 Satoshis, uh, 400,000 Satoshis that she wants to send. We create a transaction with the two UTXOs that are being consumed as input and the new UTXO belonging to Bob produces output. You can see this here. Um, the inputs to this transaction uh, were outputs from previous transactions. So you can see this UTXO comes from this previous transaction and this UTXO comes from this previous transaction. So, to create a transaction on the Bitcoin network, you have to spend UTXOs. And you can only spend UTXOs you own. So each UTXO has a public key associated with it. And you prove your ownership of UTXO by creating a signature. And that signature has to be associated with the public key attached to the UTXO. And the signature is this little blue ribbon here. As you can see, we basically created a here, a signature that proves that we actually are the owners of those uh, UTXOs. The transactions are then collected and put into a block. And the blocks, again, are chained up to form what we call a blockchain. So with that out of, out of the way, let's talk about why no other blockchain has built this direct integration yet. So it turns out that it's not that easy and there were two technical hurdles that had to be overcome to enable a direct integration of BTC into the IC. The first is a protocol level integration of the internet computer with the Bitcoin network. And this means that replicas directly communicate with Bitcoin nodes. And the integration actually allows canisters to fetch balances and UTXOs and also to send transactions. And the second hurdle was the development of a protocol suite for chain key ECDSA signatures, including protocols for threshold ECDSA signing, key generation, public key retrieval, and others. And both of these novelties are now available through the management canister API. So let's start with the protocol level integration of the internet computer with the Bitcoin network. Through this, the internet computer can obtain Bitcoin blocks directly from the Bitcoin network and process the contained transactions. And this allows for maintaining the full Bitcoin UTXO set on chain on the internet computer. Canisters can now run queries against the full Bitcoin UTXO set. And this allows the canisters to know about the held UTXOs and thus the balance of any Bitcoin address, including their own addresses. The internet computer can also submit signed transactions for the Bitcoin blockchain. And when it does, the nodes directly transmit the transaction to the Bitcoin network nodes without any need for intermediaries that might censor them. And to, and to make sure the transactions are actually included in the block, canisters can regress the current transaction fees. Let's go a little deeper and take a look at how the integration is actually implemented. It consists of two components. The first one is the BTC canister, the Bitcoin canister, that lives on a Bitcoin activated subnet and is implemented as a regular NNS managed WASM canister. It's this one here. Um, it's made accessible to canisters via an API of the management canister. And the Bitcoin canister holds the on-chain Bitcoin related state. So that is the um, UTXO set, the outgoing transactions, and the most recent Bitcoin blocks to allow for fork resolution. The other component is the Bitcoin adapter, which is down here. 
It connects to the nodes of the Bitcoin network, much like a regular Bitcoin node would do. So the on-chain UTXO set is managed by the BTC canister and adapter communicating through the Internet Computer's protocol stack. And the process starts by the BTC canister requesting successor blocks to the latest block it received from the adapter. The adapter on each replica of the subnet then obtains the blocks from the Bitcoin network. And the block making replica for this round provides the requested block to the canister through consensus. And once the BTC canister receives the block, it extracts the UTXO from the transactions contained in the block and updates the UTXO set it maintains in replicated state. When the canister wants to send a BTC transaction, it is submitted to the Bitcoin canister where it's queued. So let's put in this little queue here. Every subnet round, the Bitcoin adapter on each replica then obtains pending transactions from the Bitcoin canister and queues them for being submitted to the Bitcoin network. A cool side effect here is that this leads to an efficient and quick distribution of transactions in the Bitcoin network as every replica of the subnet submits the transactions via multiple connected nodes of the Bitcoin network. So now we know how canisters can obtain the UTXOs or balance for a given Bitcoin address and send transactions. But what's still missing is how they can actually hold BTC and securely sign transactions. And to understand how this works, we have to take a look at the second engineering novelty, a threshold ECDSA protocol suite called ChainKey ECDSA. So in a threshold ECDSA protocol, the private ECDSA key is secret shared between multiple parties and only an eligible quorum of the parties can generate a signature using their respective private key shares. And that means the secret signing key is never stored in one location. Otherwise, that would become a single point of failure. Instead, it is split up in secret shares and each secret share is stored on a different machine. And to be able to sign a message with the secret key, these machines must agree to sign a message and coordinate with one another to generate a signature in a distributed fashion. It's important to mention again that the private key never exists in reconstructed form, but only in its secret shared form, even when we are signing messages. So with this protocol, each canister can control a vast number of derivable ECDSA keys and obtain signatures for them. So since BTC addresses are tied to ECDSA public keys, this makes it possible for canisters to receive, hold and transfer Bitcoin directly on the Bitcoin blockchain in a secure manner. Let's take a closer look at how the key derivation for ECDSA um, works. So we start off with a master ECDSA key of the ECDSA enabled subnet that's generated with the generation protocol. And from this master key, we can derive canister ECDSA keys. And a single master key is enough to derive ECDSA keys for each canister on the IC using the canister principle as an input. And this key is also called the canister root key. So from canister root keys again, we can derive an unlimited number of ECDSA keys. And an input to derive a key from a canister root key could, for example, be a user principle. And this way, the canister only allows the actual owner of the principle to access the derived key. Of course, only if the canister is programmed that way and the canister is like black hole. And this in turn means that only the user that owns this principle is able to control that asset at that address, allowing him to sign transactions and receive BTC. We will see an example of this when we take a look at CKBTC later on, and then it should probably make a little bit more sense. So now that we have everything we need, let's look at a full flow. So as we know, both the Chainkey ECDSA and the Bitcoin API are available through the management canister. So the calls you see here are actually made to the management canister. So the first step is that we query the Bitcoin canister for the balance of our own address, which is this call here. And we previously uh, already derived the address from a ECTSA public key. 
uh, that we retrieved by calling the ECDSA public key method on the management canister, but that's not shown here. So once the result comes back and we made sure that the address actually has enough BTC to fund our transaction, we then request the UTXO of this address. So this is this call here. As you remember from before, we need UTXOs as an input to our transaction if you want to send Bitcoin around the network. Another thing we need to check to make sure that our transaction is included in blocks is the current transaction fee, which is this method call here. So each UTXO we include in our transaction input needs a signature proving that we actually own that UTXO. So for each UTXO, we call the sign with ECDSA method on the management canister. This is why there are multiple calls to the sign with ECDSA method shown here. And then finally, we send the Bitcoin transaction to the Bitcoin network by calling the Bitcoin send transaction method on the Bitcoin canister. So because the management canister API that exposes the Bitcoin canister and threshold ECDSA methods is a bit low level, most projects will most likely use chain key BTC or CKBTC. And CKBTC is a version of wrapped Bitcoin, like wrapped Bitcoin on uh, Ethereum that we saw in the beginning of the presentation. But it has a much stronger underlying trust model because of its decentralized architecture and because it's usage of threshold ECDSA instead of bridges. The advantage of CKBTC is that it's easier to integrate. So instead of using the low-level Bitcoin integration API, one can simply access the CKBTC ledger like any other ledger on the internet computer. And it also offers faster and cheaper transfers. So CKBTC can be transferred with the low finality time of the internet computer, so within seconds and for a fraction of the cost of a Bitcoin transfer on the Bitcoin network. And using the scheme of CKBTC, only the settlement transfers with the Bitcoin network need to be done on the Bitcoin network. And the majority of transfers can be done with the lightning speed and low cost uh, that the internet computer offers. So directly on the IC. So now that we know what CKBTC is, let's see how it builds on top of the BTC direct integration by looking at the process of converting BTC into CKBTC. So we start by querying the CKBTC minter for a BTC address reserved for us on the Bitcoin network. And this address is based on our principal ID and controlled by the CKBTC minter. And this is where this uh, key derivation comes into play. So the CKBTC minter canister can, from its, its canister root key, derive um, other ECDSA keys. And in this case, it derives a ECDSA public key by using the user's principal ID as an input. So now that we have the deposit address, we transfer the BTC that we want to convert into CKBTC to that address on the Bitcoin network. And after the transaction is final, we call the update balance method on the minter to notify the minter, triggering it to check for new UTXOs for our address. The minter will then filter the UTXOs by the one it has never seen and then transfer that amount of CKBTC into the account of the user. So yeah, as you probably already realized, uh, CKBTC actually consists of two canisters, the minter and the ledger, not one canister. And to go the other way around, the user sends his CKBTC to a dedicated withdrawal account that's also again based on the user's principle and also again controlled by the CKBTC minter canister. And note that this time to transfer, we make a call to the CKBTC ledger on the internet computer and not on the Bitcoin network. So once that transaction is complete, which should be within seconds, uh, we notify the CKBTC meter canister about our transaction by calling the retrieve BTC method. And what the minter does 
is that it then burns the CKS BTC that are now under its control and calls the send transaction method on the Bitcoin canister to send the same amount of BTC on the Bitcoin network to the user. All right. That was a lot to take in, I guess. But yeah, Amir um, said that was heavy. I agree. <clears throat> it's very advanced stuff, I would say. And it's also pretty new in general. So um, I'm going to. So Atia had one question, he said, or two questions. If I understood correctly, this uh, the BTC canister acts like an layer two. Is it as efficient as Lightning Network, for example? Mm. So the BTC canister is basically just like a canister that is able to provide other canisters on the network with UTXOs um, like for them to basically check the balance of an address or for them to get UTXOs that they need to create a transaction. And the, the Bitcoin canister also accepts transactions that other canisters want to send out to the Bitcoin network. So I am not sure if that is the definition of a layer two, but if it is, then yes, if not, then no. And I mean, what the Bitcoin or the Bitcoin integration does, it basically interacts with the Bitcoin network directly. So when you um, have a canister, that um, calls this send transaction method on the Bitcoin canister, like in this flow, um, the Bitcoin adapter holds or gets like the transactions that are stored or like cash in the Bitcoin canister and then sends them out to the Bitcoin network. So for this transaction to be like final, uh, it takes the same amount of time like any other Bitcoin transaction. So if you are transacting on the Bitcoin network using the Bitcoin canister, um, you don't have the internet computer's uh, transaction speed because the, what the internet computer does, it basically just integrates with the Bitcoin adapter and sends the transac transaction on the Bitcoin network. And then it's basically up to the Bitcoin network to process the transaction. And it takes however long it takes um, for that network i think for bitcoin it's like an hour or something so um yeah like you said we are natively um on the btc network so it's a direct integration with the bitcoin network can the internet anonymous ask can the internet uh, computer interact with the bitcoin lightning network um to my knowledge, it can't, but I'm not an expert, so maybe it can already. Um, I think I had some conversations around the topic and some people um, are interested in that. Um, but I think at this moment in time, it cannot interact with the Lightning Network, but I think technically it should be possible, but please don't uh, call me on that. Then Lee asked, do you have to call all those methods yourself or is it abstracted away? Um, with all those methods, I guess you are referring to the full flow. Maybe you can write in the chat if this is the correct slide or answer your or comment on your own question.
sequence diagram in the last part. So this one, I guess, because that's probably the only other sequence diagram I had. Is that the right one? Okay. And um, that's not abstracted away from you. That's basically considered being the easy way of interacting with uh, the Bitcoin network. I mean, you're not like really, you're, you're like kind of interacting with the Bitcoin network through the CKBTC Minter Nature, but um, it's supposed to be easier because you don't have to like, after you wrap your BTC, to CKBTC, you don't have to think about like signing transactions, creating transactions uh, mm -hmm. using uh, or signing transactions using threshold ECDSA or like uh, creating transactions. And yeah, you also don't have like the finality time of um, the Bitcoin network, but of the internet computer if you use wrapped uh, BTC or CKBTC. But yeah, so basically, what this is like what I show here. It's not like the normal interaction paradigm. It's just like I show like the way in, like how to go from BTC to CKBTC. And then on this slide, uh, slide, I show the way out, like how to get from CKBTC back to BTC. And usually you obviously only do this once. Like if I have one BTC and I want to have some CKBTC, I send a transaction on the Bitcoin network. That takes like an hour to be complete or something like that. And then I tell the CKBTC minter canister about that. The CKBTC minter canister mints CKBTC for me on the CKBTC ledger. And then it's basically only making like one call. So you basically, if you want to transfer something like some CKBTC, you just call the transfer method. If you want to have like the balance of an address on of an account, you just call the uh, account balance of method on the CKBTC ledger. So once you got into CKBTC, uh, it's very easy to communicate with the CKBTC ledger. And it's also very fast because now we're on the internet computer and now we have the internet computer's uh, finality time, which is like one to two seconds for update calls. Um, any of those, Lee also said, any of those calls can fail. So I guess you need to architect carefully. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, usually the flow that is shown here is done by the user with the CKBTC mint. Like, you don't, as a dev developer, you don't have to do anything to to get a user uh, to go through that flow because, like, CKBTC does it for you. And, yes, I'm sure they have, like, security measures in place if anything goes wrong that, um, yeah, you retry or something. I guess at some point you get a uh, like a ui provided that basically tells you to log in with like an identity solution like i don't know nfid plug stoic um, bitfinity wallet whatever is out there um, and then generates the address for you like doing this call tells you hey if you want to have ckbtc please send the ckbtc to this address and come back in an hour or so and then when you come back, you say, I sent a BTC and my block has been like included in the in the chain. You tell it to update the balance and then it means the CKBTC for you. So for this entire flow, this doesn't really in involve your dab at all. So you don't have to care about it. Um, yeah. And Tiago asked, is there any difference between, between wrapped BTC as an ETH and CKBTC in Ethereum? Uh, yes. So basically like i said um rep btc is a trusted bridge so you have to trust the custodian which is bitgo and um, to actually hold the funds like to actually keep the one-to-one -one pack of rep btc and btc um they don't have to do that if they don't want to they can basically say okay i will spend all the btc people send to me and i still mint them rep btc so the issue is like that it's not really a trustless bridge um, and rep BTC on an internet computer, you trust like the two networks that you interact with. So you trust the internet computer and you trust the Bitcoin network, but you don't have to trust anyone else uh, to get to the point where you, where you have CKBTC. And another thing is that, um, but that's maybe not part of the question, but in general, 
Ethereum is like more limited in what it can do in terms of computation and also way more expensive than the internet computer. So with CKBTC, uh, I think you have a lot of um, options uh, in comparison to um, RapidTC on, on Ethereum. Are the anonymous asked, are the BTC to CKBTC transactions at risk? during a CKBTC minter upgrade? Um, theoretically, yes, they are at risk. Um, I mean, like every upgrade to a canister, you have to make sure that you do things right. But uh, obviously, the developers of the CKBTC um, canister, they put a lot of effort into the security um, of that canister. Um, so they definitely make sure that when there is an upgrade, to the minter that um, no funds are at risk. And also, as I mentioned, the CKBTC canister is a, an NNS control canister. So it's not like there are like three people that can just say, hey, I'm gonna upgrade the code and then the code upgrades. So basically they have to submit a proposal to the NNS and then the NNS has to vote on that upgrade. Um, that also like ensures that there's nothing weird happening. And well asked, does every transaction on the CKBTC ledger result in a transaction on the BTC network? Or can you transfer a CKBTC in between accounts but keep the transaction quote unquote local to the IC? This last transfer would not incur any BTC transfer costs. Yes, that, that's exactly how it works. So as soon as you went through um, these steps, Basically, you wrapped your BTC to CKBTC. And now when you make a transaction, you transact CKBTC instead of BTC. And as you can see, this transaction here, for example, the transfer is on the IC network. It's like a canister that uh, like does the transaction. Um, so you only have to transfer or make a transfer on the BTC network for getting in to CKBTC like to get CKBTC and then to get out of CKBTC. Like when you decide, okay, I don't know, I want my BTC back. Um, then you send CKBTC to the minter and the minter returns the uh, BTC back to uh, an address of your choice. Yes, that's, that's basically the idea that you get the low transaction uh, costs and the high uh, or the quick transaction finality on the IC. Um, and also you have like the no real like trust assumptions and you have like the security um, of both networks in, involved. Mm -hmm. Can you specify how many BTC confirmations to wait for? wait for before considering the transfer final. Typically we use about six confirmations to be sure the transaction is final. But for lower values, you could use a lower confirmation count in favor of faster confirmation. Uh, I think that's implementation detail and I'm not sure like how many confirmations the um, CKBTC minter waits for until uh, it considers a transactions to one of its accounts as um, final. So uh, you would need to, or I would need to have to look at uh, at implementation. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But I'm sure it's sufficiently, um, like a sufficient amount of confirm confirmations to not like compromise on security or anything. And then HG asked users update balance from sub account call to the CKBTC minter should be made up on the beginning or the finalization of the transfer uh, of the transfer call to BTC. Mm, update balance should be made. Uh, it's kind of refers to the previous question, and it should be made uh, when the transaction is finalized, because otherwise the CKBTC minter probably wouldn't want to give you. CKBTC if there's like a chance that the yeah the block is not included in the chain.
who is the developer of the CKBTC Minter and CKBTC Ledger? Is it the Definity team? That's a question by Atia. And yes, uh, it's the Definity team that develops this. I don't know like who exactly works on it, but it's like a dedicated team um, working on both the CKBTC Minter and the CKBTC Ledger. Actually, I think it might actually be two different teams because the CKBTC Ledger is actually just a ICRC1 um, compliant ledger implementation. So ICRC1 is like a, a token standard on the internet computer that has been developed uh, together with um, the foundation and also projects in the community. Um, so yeah. Can you give the canister to CKBTC ledger, please? Uh, I want to find it on CoinLista as a question. We can try. Um, you go to the Affinity repository and you go to IC, RS, Bitcoin, CKBTC, and then you can go down to testnet. Uh, but this is just a test nut, obviously, so this is not production ready. So do not use this in production, please. Um, but down here, you actually see the um, canister ID of the minter and also the canister ID of the ledger. If Definity has the Sway Star 123 asked, if Definity has the control for upgrading CKBTC canisters, aren't we trusting the controllers? Uh, I kind of already answered this because you're not really um, like the CKBTC canister is uh, to my knowledge at least also going to be under the control of the NNS. So it's not like Definity is like the controller and Definity can just like push updates to it. Uh, it actually has to be, um, they have to submit a proposal to upgrade the canister and then the NNS has to vote on that. And only if the NNS votes, um, to basically accept that proposal, then the canister is upgraded. So it's not like one person being in control uh, of the canister. Right. I think we actually have to start uh, because otherwise we run out of time. So let me share a different screen now. <clears throat> All right, so we're actually building on the project from the previous lecture and just going to give you a quick overview what it did. So it basically leveraged the HTTP outcalls feature to make a call to the Coinbase API to retrieve the historic price of ICP. And to do that, we had to call the management canister. Uh, and to be specific, the management canister's HTTP request method, we had to also provide some cycles to pay for the um, computation that that basically incurred or, uh, yeah. And you also had to provide like a transform function so that the responses from the Columbus API were um, transformed in a way that they were the same for each of the replicas making the call. And now what we want to do is we want to actually let people pay for that service. So because we have to pay for it and like adding cycles and cycles are basically like money. So why should we give uh, this service for free? I mean, like people have to pay for it. And to pay for it, we are actually going to integrate with the CKBTC um, canister. And for that, locally, we need to run a local version of the Bitcoin network. So we're going to run a local Bitcoin uh, node. You can download that from uh, bitcoin.org. I already did that. So I'm going to head into downloads now. Oh, no, it's, 
get here. And then I'm going to unpack that. And now I'm going to um, head into the directory. I have to create like a data folder and a Bitcoin conf file. I'm not going to detail on that, um, but it's basically needed to work. And now to actually run the Bitcoin client locally, I also have a command prepared. I'm just going to copy paste. And this should now run my local Bitcoin network. It's basically kind of similar to what Defects does when we use Defects to run a local replica, but in this case, it's like one Bitcoin node instead. All right, and now we want uh, Defects to be able to actually talk to that local network that we just uh, deployed. So we're going to add like a new entry in our Defects.json that's telling um, defects about this new network available, like we enable the Bitcoin network and we tell the port that the Bitcoin network is running on. And a, oh no, this has to go into defaults. Is this in defaults? Um, no, I think, yeah. And the next thing we also have to do is we have to add like a networks entry in here as well. I don't really know why, but you have to do it. Otherwise it won't connect to the uh, local Bitcoin network. And then and we're going to stop defects. Oh, it wasn't even running. And if we are going to start it. Okay. So this is a little bit annoying, but sometimes the ICX asset process doesn't like terminate. So what I do is I basically check um, what process is running on this port because I know like the, the, the replica port or like the local defects port. And then I get this process ID and then I'm going to kill that process using um, the process ID and hopefully it works now. Okay, and what else do we do? Let's look if there's anything still running related to the effects. There is, let's put this. It's weird that the defect stuff didn't work. I'm a bit confused, but should work now. Okay. All right. Um, so now basically. Ah, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently, I only shared like a window and set up the entire screen. Let's fix this. Uh, so if you share an entire desktop, uh -huh. then it'll show everything on there. If you share the same, right. then it'll show. Okay, so you probably were confused a little bit, but I guess you, what did you see? Yes. Uh, okay, so what did you... This one. Okay, so this, this part I thought, I think you probably saw, but what you didn't see is like this whole terminal stuff I did. So I basically unpacked the uh, local Bitcoin um note so i, I downloaded it from uh, bitcoin.org um, and then i unpacked this archive i went into the bitcoin folder i created a empty folder called data i created this bitcoin configuration file which just has like some stuff in it that I copied. Um, then I went into the root directory of the um, Bitcoin um, client and I ran like a command that I also copy pasted. 
And then I went ahead and configured uh, DFX, but I think this part you saw. And then I tried to figure out why my DFX is not working. And I basically went into my uh, activity monitor and I searched for DFX in here. And then I terminated the process because somehow DFX stop didn't work. Um, now you should be up to date again. And if you see this output by the replica, you know that it basically works so that your DFX was able to connect to uh, the local um, version of Bitcoin running. So the next thing we are going to do is that we are going to um, modify our DFX.json even further. And we are going to create two new entries, um, one for the CKBTC ledger canister and one for the CKBTC minter canister. So let's do this real quick. I also prefer just because it's a lot of text actually. So we go into canisters. Um, let me just paste this here. So what happens here? It might look, might look a little, little bit unfamiliar, but what, what happens here is that you, you can actually also instead of like providing a toko file or a rust file that then is being built you can actually provide a, a wasm file straight away that tfx uses um, because as you know you compile everything running on your computer down to a wasm file and because i don't want to like set up the entire rust tool chain to build a um, ledger and ckbtc canisters and uh, definity was kind enough to provide um, the corresponding wasm files directly together with the did files that basically describe the interface of those canisters. Because if I only had the wasm file, how would I, like when I develop against it, how would I know like what kind of interface it has and what, what, are the, what, what the types are. And then you also have this remote key and this basically tells DFX, if I'm going to deploy my project to, to the mainnet, you don't have to deploy the ledger and the minted canister defined. You can actually take this canister ID with that did file to talk to that canister. And that's, yeah, that's pretty handy because we don't need our own version of the CKBTC Minter and Ledger because they are already there provided by uh, other developers. So, but now we only have the definition, but we don't have the files. So let's get the files as well. And to do that, we are going to, um, okay, that's wrong, did pause it. We're going to create like two new directories in our project. Like I said, remember, um, CKBTC actually consists of two canisters. So we need to get the ledger and the CKBTC. Um, so you go back to the slide, you see Minter and Ledger, we need, we need both of these canisters. Um, and like I already mentioned in a, for a question, uh, CKBTC follows the ICRC1 standard, and that is a combined effort of the foundation and uh, community projects. And to download those, um, we basically need like the hash of a blessed replica. So it's like uh, basically like the NNS votes on replica software, and every time uh, like a replica version is elected. There's like a associated hash to that. And for those elected replica versions, Definity also provides like um, pre-built canisters for other projects. Like for example, the CKBTC canister, the Ledger canister, the ICRC1 example canister and, and so on and so on. So if you wanna download those WASM files and those um, DIT files, you have to provide like a valid um, basically a valid hash so that the uh, download link works. If you use like a random link, there's a hash that's not like um, belonging to a blessed replica, then the download probably won't won't work because the build is not triggered and the files are not provided. And I already prepared this um, command to download those files. So I'm just going to copy paste this. As you can see, I export, I define a variable that contains the hash of the release and then I download um, from different URLs in uh, where like in, within those URLs I define the IC version up here and that way I get the uh, um, wasm files for the ledger 
they did file for the ledger and there wasn't file for the CKBTC minter and they did file for the minter. So let's download those and then move them to the correct folders because I want my CKBTC minter wasn't inside my wasn't folder. The same for the ledger and I want the div inside the div folder because those are basically the paths I specify here. And if we put them in the wrong folder, that won't work. So now we create a public version of those dits. Now it gets, it gets a bit freaky now. Um, I mean, this actually took me pretty long to figure out myself. So um, I don't know if you don't get it straight away, don't worry. Um, yeah, what we do here is we actually remove um, the initialization arguments for the service defined in the stat file. So usually what you can do when you uh, deploy a canister class, you can, or like an actor class, you can basically say, when I initialize this actor and I install it to the computer, I want to provide it with like some arguments. Uh, but we have to remove those arguments from the service definition because Otherwise, um, DFX is going to complain. And there's a reason for it. They thought I kind of understood it, but um, right now I'm not sure anymore. All right. Um, so now that, that we created those um, did files, what's next? Oh, yeah. Next, we are going to deploy the canister. So it's a good idea. So let's head back to our terminal. And um, because the deployment of those canisters is like a bit uh, like carry, um, if you do it from the command line, I don't want to like type all of this because like the init arguments are like pretty, pretty long and can be like quite complex. So I already um, have a script available that I'm going to use for that. And I'm going to call this deploy it's a shell script. I'm going to copy my content in here. And basically, what's happening in this um, in this um, script here is that we deploy the two canisters, so the the minter and the ledger. And after that, we basically follow the flow from our presentation. So after deploying the canisters, what's happening is the flow. Uh, from going from BTC to CKBTC because to deploy locally, I like need CKBTC to test if my my payment uh, service actually works. So it's a logical step that we we have to follow this um, flow to go from our local networks um, BTC to our local networks CKBTC, and that's what that's what's happening in the, in the script. And I'm not going through it by detail because it's yeah, but you can just look at it if you if you wanted to in detail after the um, after the talk. And one thing we also have to do is we actually have this uh, executable because otherwise probably won't work. And now we are going to um, run deploy. But we have to restart. My I guess I don't. Let's just try. We will find out. Let's... Okay, now we are deploying the CKBTC ledger and the CKBTC minter. And we're actually making the call to uh, the CKBTC minter to ask for the address we need to send our BTC to so that we can then from there on um, like mint CKBTC. So this is this address, like it says, get BTC address to send BTC to, to mint CKBTC for our current identity. So I'm copying this because the next step is like, so far, we only set up the BTC network, but we don't own any BTC. And to own BTC, we are actually just going to mint uh, 400 blocks, and we are going to send the rewards for those blocks to the address that we should send our BTC for uh, to. 
Um, so let's do that. Um, there is a command for that that I also prepared. Uh, I will just copy pasta. Um, we fill in our address. Um, this one. And now we are minting a lot of BTC to that address. And it might, like initially, it might take DFX a little while to actually catch up with that. So initially, it might take like, I don't know, like 20, 30 seconds until it gets to it gets to those blocks and we will see an output um, in DFX that shows the progress. As you can see now, it basically is aware of the latest blocks and it's uh, consuming them, extracting the UTXOs um, and so on. And now we're done, we're synced. Um, and now because we sent a BTC to that address by minting a, like a multi multitude of blocks, we can now press enter to continue. Then it checks the uh, balance of our current identity before minting CKBTC. We then call the update balance. I'm going to show you the flow again, so it's a bit more visual. Then call the, like this is what happened just now by minting the, the blocks. Then we are calling, or like before we check our CKBTC balance, should be zero because we don't own any CKBTC. Then we call update balance. What the minter then does is it gets the UTXOs for this address from the Bitcoin canister, checks if there are any, are any new UTXOs. And if so, it actually transfers the corresponding amount of CKBTC to our um, account. And what we then do is we basically um, trigger that um, update balance thing that returns and says, yeah, there are UTXOs I've never seen. And then we check the balance again and we see that we now own a lot of Bitcoin. So how much is that? Uh, 12,400 BTC, that's solid. If it was real, it would be cool. All right, um, so with that out of the way, what's left? We again, go back to our defects.json. A lot of that uh, live coding session happens with defects.json. And what we do is we actually tell DFX that our price feedback end has a dependency. And that dependency is the ledger canister that we defined above because we want to import the ledger into our price feedback end to then make calls to it. Um, and what we also do is we actually specify the um, public dip file now. Because otherwise, when I deploy this, um, DFX will complain and say, that's not working. You have like those init arguments in there. I can't, I can't handle it. All right, so specify the public did, add the ledger as a dependency. Um, that looks good. And like, if you were to like redeploy um, the ledger and the minter, you actually have to change this again to the normal ledger dot did. And then when you deploy your own canister that integrates with the did, you have to use the public thing. So for installing, use the ledger did, and for interacting with it, use the ledger public did. All right, but now with all of that out of the way, it's extremely simple to actually import the CKBTC ledger. It's just a matter of writing import CKBTC ledger. That's what we are going to call it. And then you write canister colon ledger. And that's it. But now you see an arrow and you wonder like, hmm, why is that? That's, that's weird. I thought everything should work. And that's one thing you have to do, and that's basically deploying um, your price feed backend, like your the canister that you actually uh, work in at this point in time. So the DFX updates the did it has stored to the ledger public did, and then the error should disappear. And as we see, it already did. All right, so we have access to the CKBTC ledger within our price feed canister. So the next, next thing I want to talk about is how we are actually going to let people pay for our service. And for that, we have this payment flow logic. 
it's kind of similar to what you need to do when you mint CKBTC from BTC. So at first, our client, this is basically the potential buyer of our service, sends a message to the receiver asking for his account. And this account, again, is a unique account that is tied to the caller of that method. So every principle or every identity has a unique account that is going to receive from the um, receiver canister. Mm -hmm. Then, now that we have that account, we are transferring uh, the funds that the receiver requested to that account. And then we are basically informing the receiver like, hey, uh, I sent the funds. And in this case, for our example, what this um, notifies is that we just call the get price method. And then what the receiver does is it actually checks the balance of this unique account. It checks if we send enough funds. And if that is the case, it's going to transfer those funds out to a treasury account. Um, and then it's going to basically give back what we paid for in our case, the historical price of ICP. And for that, we are first going to define a new type, which is the account type that's um, defined in the ICRC1 standard. I already prepared it. It's not that complicated. You can look it up if you want to in the standard um, because that's what we are going to return to callers. And now again, I have this little comma here that I have to remove. Um, all right, so the first thing we're going to build is the get account method. So public shared, and because we want to access the caller of that method, we add this um, caller thingy. And this doesn't take any arguments and it will return an async account. And in there, we are going to call the method derive account from caller. And that takes the caller. And then from that caller derives the account, which is unique for every caller. So this is supposed to be types and this doesn't exist yet. So we have to actually um, define it first. So let's do that. This is going to be derive account from caller it takes a principle of type principle and it returns no that doesn't have to be async returns types dot account and yeah it basically returns the type is just specified for the account that, that contains an owner and the owner of this sub account is always our answer because it's under our control and then a sub account which is like the unique account and um, that we tie to the call of the method and for that we define a method called derive sub account from principle where we again pass the principle okay so i have to import principle it's the first thing and uh, now it complains about price feed, unbound variable price feed. What I want to put in here is a reference to my own actor. I want to know the canister ID from the actor that I'm currently coding. And to achieve that, you can just create a reference up here to the actor and call the price feed. And then it works. And again, we haven't um, implemented derived sub account from principle yet. And this one's a little bit more complicated. So I'm just going to copy paste it for the sake of time. If you want to look into it, whoops, that's not it. If you want to yeah, look how it works, you can do that after the presentation. Again, we are missing some imports that we are going to fix now. And yeah, no errors so far. Looks good. So now we can actually get the account for a caller. So what we achieved so far is in our, no, that's a long flow. No, that's the one right here. At the end, I put here. Yeah. Okay. So what we achieved so far is that we implemented this step, get account. I mean, users could already transfer something to the account, but we didn't implement like the check if the user actually transferred something. So at this point in time, 
everyone could call get price without paying and that's so we are not done yet so but the first part is actually done which is nice so um for get price so before carrying out any action within this method so before making the http out call we have to check that the user actually funded a dedicated account for his uh, principal with enough ckbtc and to do this the first thing we are going to do is we actually query the ckbtc ledger for the balance of the derived account for the calling principal sounds complicated but uh, it's actually not that complicated you will see how it works in a second but i see that i'm over time already so i want to answer some questions and not take too much time so i'm copy pasting this so this is basically the call to check the balance it's also like defined in the icrc1 standard and if you're interested like what are the arguments as always you go into your git file and you just check out the arguments that you have to um, supply to the call so they are up here i know this was balance of wrong method but same um way of doing it all right so now it's complaining caller unborn variable that is because this method doesn't have access to the caller yet but now it does all right so now we have the balance of the derived sub account from the caller and with that we can actually check if this person sent enough uh, funds and we are now a little bit greedy on local we actually want how much is that uh that's one btc i guess we want one btc for our service and if the user doesn't give us one btc um we are telling him that he didn't send enough funds so now we're kind of protected that no one who didn't pay uh, is able to call our method but we have to do some other things um we have to actually tra transfer the balance out of this account to our treasury account because otherwise what would happen is that the user would send this one btc to the derived account once and then it will stay there because we don't do anything with it and this check will always work because there will always be uh, one btc in that account if we don't transfer it out so we have to transfer it out and again because of a lack of time i'm copy pasting this but i'm going to quickly explain it so what happens is we call the icrc1 transfer method the transfer method takes a couple of arguments that you can look at in detail in the standard or in the dit file the ones that are of, imp of importance for us are the uh, amount that we want to transfer the sub account we want to transfer the balance from and then of course also where do we want to transfer it from uh, to so the balance is actually just like the balance that we got from up here so everything that's available in the um, in the account we are going to send to our treasury so if you by accident send five ck btc and you call get price that's bad because then you overpay by four btc in, in this implementation there's no refund but it doesn't refund because it's a demo so it's definitely possible to do that of course and from which sub account are we sending it from from the sub account that we derive from the caller and where do we send it to to our own account which basically is the default account for the principal so we set the sub account to null all right um then we have some other things um we have a try block in case of a um if there's like an error thrown we, we catch that um um down here and we don't uh, execute our HTTP out call if something weird happens, maybe like, I don't know, the canister out call queue is like full or something. And that shouldn't mean that the caller gets the call for free. So we, we take care of that. There's no way around. And the other thing we do is that because of the async nature of the internet computer, when you call this balance, um, there's basically a situation where two a caller could call this method multiple times and the first check would go through like that there's enough balance but then in between like one kind of set uh, like one call transfers out the balance and the second call wouldn't be able to transfer the funds out because there are no funds left and we have to take care of this as well and thus we check the actual transfer result that uh, icrc1 returns and in the case of a transfer error we return that error and say hey we couldn't transfer the funds to the default account and in that case again um, we won't uh, execute our service all right so we go back to the 
payment flow because we are like almost done basically. So now we have get account. User can transfer funds to the account. User can notify our canister by calling get price. Get price checks the balance. If the balance is good enough, it transfers the balance out to our treasury account and then returns the price requested by the user. So let's wrap this up. Um, let's actually deploy this. So now we are going to call the get no DFX canister call price feedback and get price. So if we call this, um, we hope that the canister tells us we don't have enough fund because we didn't see and uh, send anything yet. So as we can see, that's the that's the case. So in the next step, we actually want to get the account. We have to send the funds to. That's unique for our caller principle. So this is the account we're going to use. And then we are going to use that information to send um, CKBTC to this account. And I have this prepared. So I'm just going to copy paste this. It's basically a call to ICRC1 transfer. So now we transferred one uh, CKBTC on the CKBTC ledger to the uh, unique account returned by this canister. And now that we sent the funds, we are going to call get price again. And in this case, we should actually receive um, the price that we are requested because we paid. And as you can see, that worked. This is actually the output from the Coinbase API. I explained this in the previous talk. And if you call get price again, because we transferred the funds out of that um, default account to the treasury, it shouldn't work. And as we can see, that's right. So now we actually have our payment complete and we're going to deploy this on the mainnet now to see if it, all of this like definition here with all here remote canisters and so on, if that really works. And before we do that, we actually tone it down a little bit because one, BTC is a bit much and it's hard to get one BTC on the on the uh, like production or not production here yeah, like on the on the live test net for for Bitcoin. So we are going to make this uh, 100 satoshis. We are also going to add a fee because the um, CKBTC ledger on uh, the mainnet actually has a transaction fee of 10 uh, satoshis and. Then we also have to remove those 10 satoshis from um, the balance that we want to transfer. So with that out of the way, um, so we change this, we have this, we have this. This looks good. So let's deploy this on mainnet. Actually, an unexpected error. The other errors were expected, <laughs> but this one's not expected. So let me see. I missed something. Public good. That looks good. Okay, what does it say? that this file does not exist. What is the path? I see cancels and it doesn't exist. Mm. I'm just gonna try again. Okay. 
Okay. That apparently helped. Okay, cool. <laughs> I don't know why it helped, but it helped. Um, okay, now let's call the same methods that we basically called before, but now on mainnet. And we should receive like the same behavior. So uh, we should get like a complaint that we didn't put any funds into that address yet. yet. I mean, like the message is, is, is false. It's not like one CK BTC, it's just 100 CK Satoshis. But yeah, basically we do the same thing. We now get the account. And there it is. And again, I'm just going to copy and paste this into my pre-witness. Oh no, actually we can't do that yet because um, I mean, yes, we could try and transfer some CKBTC on mainnet, but we don't actually own any. So first we have to actually like get CKBTC from the CKBTC minter. And we are doing it the same way that we did it on the um, local network, but this time on mainnet. So now we're going to ask the CKBTC minter on mainnet to give us an address to send um, Bitcoin to like testnet Bitcoin. Um, so, so, so that it then mints uh, CKBTC for us. And that's the address. And usually what you do is that you visit like a faucet. Oh, maybe actually I had some in my history. I think. This one, for example, <clears throat> and then you can enter your address and you can get up to 6,000 Satoshis and then you send them. And yeah, then you go back and notify the canister um, for this transaction. You can actually also like, um, there should be like an explorer. This one, for example. And now we can check the address that we send it to. And I like apparently already used this um, address because I was testing this as well. And the address is unique from my principal. And because my principal stayed the same because I didn't switch my developer identity, you can see like a couple of a transaction and there's like a one unconfirmed transaction and that's the one that we just sent. And usually if I would do what I am doing next, this wouldn't work because the transaction isn't like finalized yet, but because I sent another transaction yesterday, it's actually going to work. Um, straight out of the box. So that's basically this um, update balance call on the Minter Cadaster. Usually I would have to wait for the block to be like included in the blockchain for this to, to work. <clears throat> oh yeah, now it's telling the CKBTC Minter, hey, check for unspent UTXOs. And if there are any, please mint the same amount of CKBTC for me. And that happened. So now I have a couple thousand, like one one point five million satoshis in CKBTC that were minted to me. And I can actually check my balance using that command. And it's going to be more than one point five um, million because, like I said, I did this multiple times, so it's like three million. And yeah, the last step is to actually send those CKBTC to the address that the minter. Add a price feed wants us to send them to. So let's do that. <clears throat> so we send 100 Satoshis as uh, the, the price feed canister requested. So this is like a CKBTC Satoshis, of course, on the CKBTC ledger, as you can see here. And that worked. What you get back here is uh, the block. Basically, you know, we check if the funds arrived.
And as we can see, we actually received 100 Satoshis. So now that we funded this account, we are able to call get price again. And now it should work because now we paid what price feed wanted us to pay. This takes a little while because there are some like multiple rounds of consensus involved. And as you can see, that worked. So now we actually implemented our CKBTC payment flow on the mainnet. Pretty exciting stuff. And last thing I'm going to do is to check that actually our price week canister transferred the funds out of the um, user account into the treasury account. And yes, we have now 90 Satoshis inside our treasury. And the reason for that is because we had to pay a 10 um, Satoshi transaction fee. And again, sorry for it taking so long, but that's basically it. I can imagine that there are probably a couple of questions now. So um, let me check them. Okay. Q and A. So Anonymous asked, is it also working the same with other cryptocurrency or crypto networks? I guess you refer to the direct integration. Um, I guess the foundation could do this for other uh, blockchain networks as well, but it's a lot of engineering effort as you probably saw. Um, yeah, so it takes a long while and I think they probably only do it if it makes sense uh, to do it. So Bitcoin is like a very well-known uh, network. So here it made a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of sense to enable this um, functionality, but it could in theory be done for other projects as well. Um, and I think that kind of answers that. Um, uh, Lee gave me a tip. Thank you, Lee. And Atia asked, any way to get all the CKBTC transactions that a wallet made in the last seven days with our canister? Or do we have to develop this function on our own to have a history or to have the history? Mm, that's a good question. So all transactions that a wallet made with our canister. I mean, I think there's no endpoint for that in the ledger directly. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't see, yeah, I don't really see anything related to that. I mean, there, there are like, archive canisters that like hold all the transactions that were done but i'm currently like not aware of their interface so i don't know if you are actually able to say give me all transactions from this to this in the past seven days but you could certainly like get the data out of the archive canisters and then uh, just yeah get that information off chain or locally or something and i think in the future because the icp ledger is also um, going to change to uh, the IC or to implement the ICRC1 standard. And by doing that, I guess they also kind of like change the uh, Rosetta API thing that they provide, which is to my knowledge, at least a way for exchanges to send transactions and also to get the information uh, that you basically want to get, like who sent uh, transactions to this address in the last seven days. Um, so yeah, that should later on work. Um, yeah. I hope that answers. Good. Okay, let me just read the chat real quick. Okay, a lot of people complaining about the black boxes, but that should be should have been resolved. Lee has another question. Why do we use the normal DIT with actor parameter for build? but the adapted actor, no parameter for calling the functions. 
um he has so i'm not sure if the like uh hey I, I don't i don't know if i'm like able to really like explain this um but like so when you deploy the minter and the ledger to deploy them initially you need to provide the arguments because they are like required by the actor class like you cannot not provide the initialization arguments so when you deploy them you have to provide them but then later on when you want to import them in your um, in your canister that you're developing locally and you tell dfx like hey here's a dit that that dit file has the initialization arguments then like like how i tried to explain it to myself i don't know if it's correct is that dfx is then basically confused because it's not like it, it cannot like it cannot provide those arguments because when you import a canister like there's no way to say i want to import this canister and at the same time i want to initialize it with those arguments so that's why you have to basically scrap the initializations arguments and initialization arguments to the canister class when you're actually like uh, developing against it because yeah i mean that's that's how i explained it to myself i hope that makes sense So, any more questions? I would wait for until like 35 and then I think we can wrap it up. Also, I'm trying to again provide the slides with the recording of this lecture. And if you want to see like the code um, that I've written, basically, you can on the slides go all the way to the end to live coding. And that will basically provide you with a link. And in that link, you see everything that I just did for both my, my lectures. And I will also provide like a link to a GitHub repository with two um, branches. One branch is called probably BTC and the other HTTP. And then like in the corresponding branch, you can see the, the code. That's like the final code for what we built throughout the lecture. So I guess no more questions. Thank you for joining in and for asking questions. Uh, good luck with the rest of your project. I also wanted to take the opportunity to uh, tell you about the Definity Grants program. So if you get out of this uh, boot camp and you feel like you have a you have a good idea that you want to like follow on, um, Definity has a pretty big and pretty nice grants program. And you can find more information on definity.org slash grants. Um, so yeah, we would be happy to see your applications to it. And with that, happy hacking. And yeah, talk to you soon. Bye, guys.